it's hot. Um, and we've been listening to some really amazing presentations, um, different perspectives on the good city. And when I was considering um, my talk today, I was really thinking about good city. Like, what does that mean? Who defines good? Good for whom? Um, all the similar questions that we've been hearing. And uh, so I'm going to be focusing on Detroit. Uh, as a good city, as a not so good city, and as a potentially amazing city. So, in Detroit, um, I just will start off with like the good part. Uh, we are on fresh water. We have 20% of the world's fresh water. We are on an international border. You can literally see Windsor, Canada, right across the way. You can swim there if you want to. Um, we have 85% black population. We are the only city like that in the United States with that highest percentage. It's probably the best part of the city. Um, we are on indigenous land, Anishinaabe, and that's important to understand and know the energy of that. Um, what else? We do amazing urban farming. We have citizen-led innovation. There are a lot of amazing things happening in Detroit because Detroiters are amazing. And I want to be clear in that because I'm about to go in. <laughs> but as we know, Detroit is definitely facing challenges. I'm going to focus on only one issue. There's a really long, long list. Um, and that list will basically look like uh, that people are being colonized and pushed out of our city. And I use the word colonization on purpose. This is not a gentrification where like young white couple comes into black neighborhood and then we can't afford the rent and then we gotta move. No, they are foreclosing on occupied homes and then leaving them abandoned to rot. They are, this is the city government. Um, they are, shutting off water as we speak, and this is what this is speaking to. And that's what I wanna focus on. Uh, they are shutting down schools in our neighborhoods, and they are definitely <clears throat> ensuring that our environment is almost uninhabitable in the neighborhoods outside of the wealthy areas. So with the water shutoffs, we have right now, March 18th, they announced that 17,000 homes would have their water shut off. One in six homes in 2016, out of the 175,000 that received water, one in six were facing water shutoffs. They purposefully do it in the summer. It's in the newspaper. They also attach the water bills to your home. So if you pay your taxes, but you don't pay your water bill, you're, you could lose your house. And on top of all of that, it causes a public health risk. So we have thousands and thousands of homes with water shutoffs as we speak at the moment. It's hard to get the data. The water department doesn't want to give it to us. People don't want to report it because if you report it, you'll lose your child if you have a child. So the public health risk um, was actually documented by Henry Ford Hospital. Their global health initiative report came out last year. And it said that if you live on a block where there are water shutoffs, um, one or more houses, you're one and a half times more likely to get a waterborne disease. I've been a teacher. I've taught children living without water. That child, if it had, if they had a disease, would affect the entire school because it's communicable, it's transferable. And so, you know, city government, which is supposed to serve its citizens and its residents, to protect and to ensure prosperity, but yet penalizes the poor. Our average water bill is $75 which is two times more than the national average. The reason it's so high is because we're processing the sewage from the suburbs. So it's contracted that the suburbs get the water from us, 
we send it out and then we take their sewage and process it. So your water bill might be actually $10, but the sewage bill would be the $65. And it accrues quickly. Right now, Detroit is facing a 64% poverty, 64 poverty rate, if you in include the working poor. So why would a mayor allow for water shutoffs to keep going, knowing that he has such a high poverty rate and a high unemployment rate? And this is what my, my whole concern has been about government. What is the role of government? How are you actually supposed to serve us, right? Excuse me. So I just want to like give you a couple of quotes. The council member of um, Mary Sheffield, council member of Detroit, she said that she knows that the water department will keep water flowing in abandoned homes. The water department doesn't know about two thirds of the home, if the two thirds of the homes are occupied um, because they just send it out to occupant. Uh, they know that the bills are wrong. The inefficiencies are great. They understand that, but nothing has really changed. The head of the department, the water department, who is the former police chief, and he was a city council member, he said, I've disconnected a lot of, a lot of people, but poverty is poverty. These things happen every day. So that's our city government. That's how they think of us. When the mayor on camera was asked about the water shutoffs and please stop the water shutoffs, he was like, pay the bill. This is a very paternalistic kind of relationship. This is a relationship like you, citizen, must listen to me. Um, you have no power. <laughs> and we're going to disregard your situation completely. And also, we're going to penalize you for being in that situation and give you really no way out. This is why I ran for mayor of Detroit. I was completely fed up with all of the challenges that we have been facing. Social justice groups for years have been advocating for resolutions. For instance, advocating for the water bill to only be 2% of your income. That's reasonable. They won't do it. In fact, they haven't even looked at any other way <laughs> to basically uh, make sure that citizens are provided water. So as a candidate for mayor, my whole purpose and focus was to make sure that people understood how government could be and the different resolutions to our challenges. I was literally there to plant the seeds. I was tired of politicians giving us the same old, same old, same old line. Jobs, jobs, jobs. Uh, increase in corporate interests or whatever it is, but none of it was human-centered. And that's the kind of government that we need right now, especially when you're dealing with a 64% poverty rate. Now, as a candidate for mayor, I had to come up with a plan. And I really enjoy that. As an intellectual, as a theorist, you know, it's, you, you, we're always talking about it, right? We're talking about it now. We, we chat and chat about plans. But it's one thing to talk about, it's another thing to actually present it to the public who it will actually affect, right? Uh, and I had to really think hard and long about it. And the thing that I had to really consider was that Detroit is majority black American. It is majority of color. We have a high Latino um, population. We have a Bengali population and more. If, that, if we really have to really look at that um, to understand the strategies to put, put in place, this is not just a city. This is a black city. This is a black city in the United States of America that has systematically oppressed black and brown bodies for centuries. And they have embedded that oppression into the very institutions and systems that we rely upon to govern our city, to police our city, to ensure health 
for our citizens. So really, what, we're, what we really need to understand is that it's not just, oh, there's these policies or it's design. We have to go much, much deeper to the root. My whole goal as a candidate was to figure out how we can stop the poverty cycle and empower citizens, get them out of survival mode and into prosperity. But when you're dealing with environmental racism, when the water bills are wrong and no one's listening to you and you owe thousands of dollars on it and you, you think you're gonna lose your home um, because of a foreclosure that's impending uh, and you're unemployed, right? All of these things are compounded and they all inform each other. This is why it is incredibly important that we have to talk about decolonization. We have to decolonize our systems and develop new systems because the systems that we have right now were only meant to exploit black and brown bodies. Now, with the decolonization, I, in the social justice community in Detroit, we talk about this quite a bit. But I really want to get deeper into how do you decolonize? It is absolutely important that we decolonize um, the mind first. Because anything that we design in the mindset that we're in right now will just carry all that crap with it. All the racism, sexism, classism, everything. And we'll just build it into whatever's new. And this is why I really, really love Afrofuturism. Afrofuturism is a cultural movement. It's an arts movement that was coined in 1996 by a cultural critic named Mark Derry. Since that time, it has evolved rapidly. And it has included and expanded um, in many different ways. I think that a lot of people might know about this term now because of the Black Panther film, which is a really good example of Afrofuturism. Afrofuturism takes speculative fiction, science fiction, magical realism, horror, fantasy, to really discuss the challenges that black bodies face. Um, and I will pause here. I say black bodies because that is exactly what is being targeted. It's not our mind, it's not necessarily a culture that comes next. It's our black body. It is on that base level, unfortunately. And uh, so, with Afrofuturism, you look at um, Af excuse me, mythologies and legends from the African diaspora, you look at new technologies, and you wonder how are all of those things going to affect the black body? What kind of futures can we imagine for ourselves where we are in control of our destiny, um, where we're healthy, where we're prosperous? But also, Afrofuturism is a really great way to critique the now and to create a new framework for developing new strategies that really assist, support, protect, encourage the black body. Examples are Sun Ra, the jazz musician. I know some of you know him. Uh, Sun Ra was um, <laughs> infamous for dressing at all times. Uh, and he said that he was from the planet Saturn. And his music, if you listen to it, it sounds like stars and planets. It's really great. If you don't know him, Google him and definitely listen to his interviews. And this is Black Panther. Who saw Black Panther? Awesome. Great. So now you understand like the conversation about building a black utopia, which is Wakanda in Black Panther. That is an ongoing conversation and has really sparked the imagination of people to imagine would it be like to have a safe utopian space where black bodies can thrive without any sort of white intervention? And they're unapologetic about it, which is really awesome. <laughs> I really, really enjoy that. So um, thinking about <clears throat> Afrofuturism, as much as it's a cultural movement, there are certain principles that kind of resonate through all of the work that comes out of Afrofuturism. One of them is that Afrofuturism is ancestrally rooted. You honor the past, so
so that it can inform the future. You have to remain grounded in your ancestral roots. This is very, very important. And as we know, with colonization, you're broken away from your cultural roots, your history, and that part of your identity is hard to kind of connect to. But with Afrofuturism, we love to look at different mythologies, cosmologies, and legends from the past that show up in our present and future. It is also looking at time, Afrofuturism, definitely uh, questions the construct of time. It's no longer linear, it's a non-linear space. And then you have resilience. Resilience and the ability to adapt to change at any point in time. Octavia Butler, a science fiction writer, wrote, God is change, change is God. And this is something that we hold true to. We are experimental. That is probably at the core of Afrofuturism. And it's the thing that I absolutely enjoy the most. Um, the idea that no matter what you do, it's going to <laughs> kind of be supported, no matter how you dress or how you sound, what you produce um, within an Afrofuturist space. If you're experimenting, there is lots of latitude and patience and acceptance within that. And if not, like full on encouragement. And then it's pleasure. I'm really, I'm a pleasure activist which means that I live by the pleasure principle. Every moment of every day should be pleasurable. If it's not, I need to check in and see why. Pleasure elicits joy and play and delight. We need all of those elements in our lives to enjoy this human experience. Hence the reason why I wear heart glasses, I love sequins, I love to make people smile, especially when we're talking about some really heavy things. Um, Afrofuturism is forward thinking. We really want to push all limitations that we have in our minds and move beyond that as much as possible. And that's something that I really brought to the campaign of being forward thinking. I think it's really important to bring other people along with you when you are in that mode. Because some people don't really feel comfortable entering that space. Um, they don't want to take that risk, to think that far, just to think and imagine. And then it's all about trust, Auth authenticity. This is really key, especially when we're thinking about our current government systems. If on a, shoot, oh, <laughs> weekly we're hearing about police shootings, how much do you trust the police? Uh, if your city government is taking your home and shedding water, how much do you trust city government? Then why would you vote? Why would you participate in that system? You, you feel invisible within that or an object just to be exploited. So trust is extremely important and transparency. And then co-creation. When I was uh, running for mayor of Detroit, I held co-creation sessions in my campaign office. Uh, we sat around in a circle. I would bring, it was weekly, and I would have, bring up a different challenge, adult literacy, um, thinking about restorative justice practices, uh, growing the creative economy. And I would present my idea about how to tackle that issue and then open it up and people would just talk and, t and share their own personal experiences, which is really key. As a politician, you only know but so much, but it's really important to like expand your knowledge. After the co-creation sessions, that's when I really um, felt it was important to actually bring out the more radical idea that I had in the beginning. It felt like people were ready for that. And, you know, as an artist running for mayor, <laughs> you know, you don't want to be too radical. But towards the end, I did present a plan of action. And that plan of action um, 
literally culminated all of the information I got from my co-creation sessions, but it began with Detroit needing a universal basic income system. And that universal basic income system, I suggested could be partly paid in cryptocurrency. Well, that opened the floodgates. Um, I gained a couple of votes, which was kind of cool. Um, people were excited that I was talking about these kind of new ideas, and I really didn't re realize like the large, large uh, interest and community um, that it would attract. So I called the cryptocurrency decoin, and to this day, people are wanting that decoin. But the idea was that if Detroit created its own cryptocurrency, then it could circulate through the city and hopefully strengthen our local economy. Also, it would provide income so that people can have their basic needs met, shelter, food, transportation. Um, those basic resources should never be difficult to, to attain, uh, in my estimation. So, <clears throat> and thinking about now, uh, still thinking about eradicating the po poverty cycle, which I think government exacerbates and really probably creates that cycle. Intentionally, unintentionally, I don't know. But government has a huge, huge responsibility in this poverty cycle. And so I really wanted to go deeper into what can we actually do to decolonize um, these systems, like in a real, real viable way. So thinking about like people, this is W.E.B. Du Bois' book, um, thinking about uh, various thinkers and activists and the different plans that they had, I noticed a common thread of cooperative economics. In uh, 1907, W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, in this book, talks about 154 black American cooperatives that were operating, which is kind of amazing to me. <laughs> And, uh, and so now, fast forward to now, we have Adrienne Marie Brown, who's an Afrofuturist based in Detroit, who talks about uh, systems that are based on nature, emergent strategy. And in her book, she talks about cooperation, but also decentralization. And it is, for me, that was like confirmation for me that my idea that to decolonize means to decentralize the system. And so I'm only talking about the system here. The mind can only be expanded, I believe, through the arts. And the mind can only shift, the shifting of consciousness is really up to the individual, and that is harder work. Um, but thinking about the systems, it's a really exciting moment right now we actually had the technology that can create a decentralized way of cooperating, cooperating with, all, uh, with our community in a way that is economically viable. So that brings me to blockchain technology. And I heard a little bit about it uh, in the previous session and got a little excited. I was like, oh, are we going to finally talk about it? No, not really. <laughs> <Duh>. <laughs> Blockchain technology. For the past couple months, I've been active in our meetup group, Detroit Blockchainers, I'm really just trying to learn. I am not a techie, and I'm not a finance person. So trust me, I was lost for like three months. But I still decided to go and sit and understand it. Why? Because blockchain, blockchain technology is going to be informing so many parts of our lives we don't even, we can't really imagine it at the moment. They say that we're at the email phase like of the internet. We're at the email phase of blockchain technology. So it's really, really new. And, um, and so I really enjoy talking about it. No matter what industry you work in, I think you should know about it. So blockchain technology is basically a ledger, a digital ledger that is immutable, which means you can't change it. It's trusted because it's transparent. Um, 
And it does, it does away with any third party need for holding the information. Blockchain technology is the technology that is behind, oops, sorry, uh, cryptocurrency. And uh, so that's what you know, Bitcoin is cryptocurrency. There are over a thousand cryptocurrency coins out there right now. Um, a lot of people don't realize that they think it's just Bitcoin, but there's so, so many. And the reason there are so many is because people are experimenting right now. But what is really interesting about blockchain technology, you have the opportunity to not just create a new type of financial system um, that is peer-to-peer -peer based, you also have the opportunity to create a new kind of government system. So Lieberland is a micronation, and it sits between, I think it's Serbia, oops, um, I think it's, yeah, it sits on the western Danube, and it's brand new, it's about, it was uh, formed in 2015, and it sits between Croatia and Serbia. And uh, it was a Czech politician who founded it. He, he is trying to experiment with decentralized autonomous government, which means that the citizens of Lieberland are, it's basically the government. What is really interesting about de um, decentralized autonomous um, government system <laughs> is that we could potentially create a smart contract on a blockchain. And a smart contract is basically um, a program that you tell the rules and then it runs on its own. So basically, we can say these are the rules for the government and then it just runs on its own. Uh, and so that's like one of the, the ideas that has come up. And that's exciting because I really was into um, participatory practice, like participatory budgeting um, I presented when I was campaigning. I really like citizens to be deeply involved because then maybe they have a more vested interest um, if they know that they have the power and their voice will be actually reflected. Lieberland will be using a cryptocurrency, and that's outside, um, and that is decentralized finance, which really gets into the kind of cooperative economics possibility, depending on how you structure it. And um, it creates a way, an alternative way for be people to build wealth, quite honestly. And it kind of brings us out of the economic slavery system that we have right now. And that potential, all into its own, is super exciting. And, uh, and there's a lot, a lot of um, projects that maybe when, during question and answer I can talk about that are they're looking at how cryptocurrency can uh, help solve for those gaps of like the informal economy. Like I think we talked about that a little bit. Um, where it can also create that um, synergy, support cooperatives, um, and, and so on and so forth. So it's, it's a really in incredible moment right now. But in, to get to that point, we have to decentralize communication. These are my friends right now. They're creating a mesh network. A mesh network is basically putting up a satellite at a house and then uh, putting up a satellite maybe a block away at another house. And so the signal bounces from house to house within the neighborhood, and that means that everyone in that area can have access to free Wi-Fi. And that right there, that access is important. 40% of Detroiters are living without internet. The reason is because cable companies look at credit scores of the area not just yours, of the entire area to determine um, your, the speed, the bandwidth that you're able to access, or if they even want to offer it at all. And of course, with all the foreclosures, I think it was 100,000 foreclosures and 
since 2014, then uh, of course credit is kind of destroyed all over Detroit. So this is out uh, of Allied Media Projects. Uh, Allied Media Projects, please look them up. They're all about digital justice work and they're really great. So this is happening right now in four different neighborhoods in Detroit. But that's not, you know, of course, access to internet is one step, but then actual literacy, right? I love in Estonia, which is a digital country, uh, they teach coding to five-year-olds. Five. I don't, kids in the US don't get it at all. It's not even part of our curriculum. So that's how far behind we are, right? There are generations <laughs> that are going to be so far ahead of us, so more advanced, and have that understanding of the digital space that they're, they're probably going to be innovating, right? And so one of the reasons that I talk about blockchain technology, um, with the limited knowledge that I have, is simply because I really want to make sure that those who are usually X'd out uh, marginalized communities mainly, um, that they know that it exists, that they can learn about it. Um, right now, companies want blockchain engineers all over the place. So how do we make sure that people are participating such a nice, diverse group? And so, you know, it's really important that the knowledge is spread. And so access to the internet, learning about coding and blockchain technology, all of these things are empowering no matter what your background. And the reason I keep saying that is because for years I've been a curator and did not want to learn about any sort of techie anything. But now I'm understanding how important it is as we move into the future that each your background is needs to know about technology and how it works and how it can affect your work or support your work. And that is like definitely the plan that I have for Detroit in terms of thinking about how a decentralized government system, a decentralized communication system, a decentralized financial system can all work in, the, in our city to help usher us into the future. One thing that I really love is in Estonia, um, the story that I, I received, was that um, when they were no longer with the Soviet Union, they kind of were like, all right, we can kind of start from scratch in terms of the government that they set up. And so they went into um, using open source data and decided instead of trying to, I guess, catch up or be where the rest of the world might be, um, they just went into the future. And now they are literally informing and teaching Japan and France how to become digital countries, which is really amazing. And so that is, you know, I think for Detroit, instead of us thinking about how can we get to like a point where we're competing with other cities, I want us to go past that into the future. So that's what Afrotopia is doing right now. We have a book club where we read Afrofuturist literature. I curate film, Afrofuturist film. We have dance parties. And all of these things are to help expand the imagination. But at the moment, like our main focus is research. We're looking at what kind of blockchain initiative that we can implement that would really support black and brown bodies and the city of Detroit. And those, those are the kind of strategies <laughs> that I think that will help thwart things like automation. I know some of you are not big into it, but when already jobs have been taken away in Detroit, we need to know about automation, right? We need to know what other jobs are going to be affected. With blockchain technology, a lot of the professional jobs are going to be affected. For instance, uh, accountants, will no longer be needed necessarily. That's prediction. So, you know, thinking about, thinking about the future and really understanding what is impending, what people are working on, and thinking about how we can innovate using the technologies that we have to either protect ourselves or to participate. 
And uh, so that's what my friends and I in Afrotopia are working on. Please feel free to contact me if you want to or follow me. And I'm down for a conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that was really exciting. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll kick off the talk with just a quick thought. I mean, something so compelling is that some of these ideas are really, are really scary for people in all kind of uh, all kind of segments and things we talk about. But I think what's maybe so effective is that you combine social interest, social justice concerns, uh, some of the technological things, with your art practice and creation practice, which helps kind of influence the structures of the imagination. So in terms of kind of grassroots organizing with a lot of the community groups you do, I wonder kind of what advice you might have on how those things come together and how uh, advice on, on how to bring, I guess, creative practice into policy. Yeah, you know, I think oh, to some. Yep. So uh, I think that first of all, one of the questions that I got all the time uh, was, uh, are, "Are you an Afrofuturist candidate, or uh, what is an Afrofuturist platform?" And I had no idea; nobody done it before. <laughs> um, and I think that, you know, when it comes to create the creative part, the visual part of Afrofuturism, I definitely used it um, to kind of seduce people and bring them closer so that they can hear about the various issues and we can have a, you know, a conversation. Um, it definitely, as being a creative, I was able to appeal to a large population that really feels like they've been ignored or they have no trust in government. So a lot of people who voted for me just usually don't vote, period. Uh, so that was an honor. Um, but I think that uh, more than anything, as a creative, you can think outside the box. You're not afraid to go beyond the rules, to break the rules, um, and what, however things have been done, um, you don't really care. <laughs> You're like, that's great, and it's good to know, So, but we can still do X, Y, and Z. It's the possibility, there's space for it. And I think that that's really um, the, the best part of it, is the creative thinking. Do you find that it divides people, though? Some people respond well to that, and some people maybe respond less well, or? Yeah, I think it's a, it's, it, it takes time for people to take you seriously, but uh, over time, they did. <laughs> uh, because I stayed on issue, and they, and they understood it wasn't an art pro project, and that, but that took longer. But the plan that I came out with, the plan of action, solidified, and they were like, oh, no, she's really <laughs> thinking about things, and so that was really great. Does anyone out here have any questions? Um, Wendy? of this notion of decolonizing. I mean, it's something which comes up all the time, obviously, if you can imagine, in the African context. Um, how does one justify modeling um, particular aspects of, uh, I'm using Detroit as the example here, because it's, it's your example, um, based on a country like Estonia, which is pretty much part of the European world, but you know, you could argue that perhaps it was colonized by the Soviet Union or something, but it's just, you know, I mean, I suppose for me, it's it's, be, it's become very complicated to talk about decolonization um, because because of exactly the reference that, that you're making, right? That, that, that it's very hard not to take the imagination into places um, that seem to be innovative wherever they may be. And so my question to you is, how does that relate back to your core idea, which is to decolonize? Um, it's, not, it's not necessarily being critical. It's, it's, a, it's really about questioning fundamentally what our models are and, and how honest we can be about 
the fact that sometimes we do need to turn to parts of the world that, you know, that themselves may have experienced um, a variety of, uh, of historical traumas or whatever the case may be, which are different <coughs> from what's embodied in, in the black body, as you put it. So I'm just, I'm just really curious about that. Um, <clears throat> so Estonia is just a very unique country at the moment. No other country is doing what they're doing. And so as much as I look at them as an example, I'm still trying to figure out how that applies to Detroit in our culture and our way of being. Um, with Lieberland, for instance, they create, they're creating a decentralized justice system. And it's an interesting model uh, where it's very restorative justice kind of based. Like if I steal your boat, then there's restitution and maybe some of my cryptocurrency, my token, my Liberland tokens are gonna be taken away. Um, so you're penalized in that way. And so I'm like, well, that's cool, but I, I kind of want to go deeper with that. So for me, it's kind of like starting points in a way. Um, I, I don't think that it's like completely outside of the realm of what we've been thinking for so long. And that's why I referenced W.B. Du Bois, who really advocated hard for cooperative economics. So I'm still st staying within black American culture, um, the idea to, that the way to accumulate economic wealth is through cooperatives. Uh, so but I'm just trying to figure out how to make it more viable, um, more organized, trustworthy, and expand it across a whole entire city. <laughs> um, and so, you know, the technology is there, and because this is all experiments, nothing is actually in action, really, with blockchain technology. Everything is in theory right now. Um, so I'm just looking at all the theories. I'm like, oh, that's a good idea, or oh, that's another good idea. Um, there's all kinds of tokens that are doing some really amazing things. Um, like, uh, there's the Chama Pesa, where uh, the Chamas are cooperatives, and so they are creating, um, it's on the blockchain, and they're creating these tokens, you can have different accounts, but also, you, if there's a transparency, so you see what the treasure, how much is, it's holding, um, and that, I think it's happening in India, so, you know, that, or it may be happening in India, <laughs> So I think that you know there are in like the global south. There's a lot of projects that are happening that are really really interesting that are on the blockchain. Um, but I was just looking at Estonia in terms of its government. Um, first of all, the average age of, of their government is 28 years old. So that just changes everything, and I, I really can't do much with that um, <laughs> in terms of making sure a 28 year old becomes. Um, head of our government, uh, and that's on a federal level. So, you know, I think that uh, their, their level of willingness to be that innovative uh, when the rest of the world hasn't even gotten there yet is really interesting, and you got to respect that. Just to add to that, maybe something struck me is, um, I mean, if, if you're of the mindset that you consider the U.S. to be kind of imperial, mm -hmm. then um, just by looking at things like participatory budgeting in Porto Alegre, mm -hmm. you are kind of decentering the US, uh, you're kind of um, decolonizing in a sense, right, in the moment. Um, the sense that you never really talk about the, U the US is considered always exceptional in the studies debates, I think. It's quite rare to talk about security budgeting, for example, uh, beyond just Estonia. Anyone else? Malik? Sure. Uh, thank you for your, your imagination and for your work. Um, for, well, well, uh, for well over a century and a half, Detroit has been America's weirdest city, <laughs> by far. And weird in that it, had, it was able to gestate and to hold forms of black life that were oftentimes unprecedented anywhere else in, in, in America. Um, forms of black life also that were replete with references to science and, I mean, Minister Fahd would preach Islam and astrophysics on, on street corners. But clearly, Detroit paid a price for this kind of daring. Uh, 
for this kind of gestation, for this kind of holding. It paid a huge price, unlike a lot of other American cities. So I'm just wondering how your work and your own daring deals with the traumas of that past. And in some ways, what is it about the moment now which you see as somehow opportune to kind of move beyond those traumas into new territory? Uh, so I, I think it's the citizen-led innovation that is what is going to move us beyond the trauma, or it's working in that direction. Um, and that looks like the mesh networks. Um, I know somebody who has a uh, 3D printing lab that is free and open to anyone to learn. Uh, with the water shutoffs, we have water stations all over the city for people to get water. Uh, it is literally the people, you know, we're clear about the trauma, we don't let it stop us. We don't slow down. Maybe that's what makes it so weird. But I think it's in our blood to innovate and to push boundaries and to, to go as far as we can go. Um, so with my work um, as an individual, as a curator, uh, curating film has been my way to address traumas. Um, and having a book club. It's really liberating for people to read science fiction or to see black bodies in different situations. Uh, and I think for me, that was really important for Detroit because we're in the Midwest. Um, we are not necessarily Afro-global in the way that I want us to be. Uh, so bringing kind of this, all this artwork uh, is my way of kind of expanding um, our imagination about who we are beyond just being Detroit centered, if that makes sense. Uh, and I think that that's helpful because there is a whole other generation that doesn't, they don't know when Detroit was prosperous. They don't, they don't know anything. They're born into a very challenged city. Um, so this helps them to travel without leaving. Um, and then as an artist, uh, I create sculptures. So I became an artist actually to address the traumas in Detroit. And more importantly, to help people, energize people who are working on the ground every day and having to deal with this. It's, it's, it can be very exhausting. I don't know how much you know about Detroit, but everything is mixed. We don't have one side of town that's poor, per se. Um, upper, middle, and lower income neighborhoods are just all intertwined, which means that you cannot ever, ever, ever escape the, like what's going on in the city. Just can't. Um, and as much as I really love that you can't go into a class's bubble, it does wear on you. It's exhausting, it's heartbreaking when you see kids walking through litter to go to school. Um, to know that there's mold in the school building, you know, like it go, the list is just so long. So it, it gets really, really, it does become really exhausting. So I started creating meditations from the sounds of stars and planets. And, uh, and that's, that's kind of like, and that's a more literal, direct way of it, addressing trauma. Um, and I also make sculptures out of healing crystals so that they are like resonating and healing your body. Um, my artistic practice is solely um, centered on healing traumas in black bodies, but knowing that in order to have that happen, everybody has to be healed. Um, and so, you know, that, that's where I think my recognition that we can, we can be strong <laughs> and we can do the work, but we're still exhausted uh, at the exact same time and we need everyone to be at their peak to deal with all that we're dealing with in Detroit. Sorry. Um, I really liked your talk, and I was particularly interested in this idea of humor. So you said you love to make people laugh, and you also embody that in the way, you know, to their glasses and the colors, 
uh, if I understood it correctly. Yeah. 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 And this made me think about a book uh, that's called Louder Out of Place, where people uh, Louder Out of Place, where people use humor and and jokes, and this is sometimes also to a way of avoidance or uh, lack of power for confrontation and 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 uh, so you, it's almost a strategy to survive these difficulties of you know racism or unfairness, injustice, and deprivation, and so on and so forth. But uh, the way you you use it, if I understood it correctly, is more uh, I don't know a mechanism to be able to speak of things that are very difficult um, without being. I don't know, too hard. So I'm, I'm caught in between whether humor as a powerful instrument of communication or it just diminishes the power of the message. Mm. And if you can build up on that. So, uh, okay, there's, that's a lot to unpack. Um, it is a survival mechanism. It is a mechanism to protect myself um, quite out, like, at times, not all the time, do I always use um, this kind of level of performance to do that. But I am aware that, especially from around a black man, like my partner, um, that people will treat him differently than they will treat me, and so that we're not we're not going to receive as much of the racism or you know whatever from people, the negative energy if a girl with hard glasses is like in front of you, right? Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm very clear, it's a, that's a strategy for sure. <laughs> um, personally, I just love, I just love playing and I think it's, uh, I don't think adults do it enough and that makes life for me personally really boring and especially if I gotta be around you and you don't play either. <laughs> so, um, you know, this is human experience is already extremely, extremely, extremely difficult. So as many times that we can laugh, I think it's important. Now, when I was on the campaign trail, um, I definitely dressed conservatively, but yeah, as a curator though, but conservatively, right? Because I didn't want people to be distracted by me. I wanted them to hear my message. So my hair was straight and everything, and people really, came after me for straightening my hair. <laughs> but number one, it's just so much easier to deal with. And then number two, I just don't want people to be like, oh, the girl with the afro, and like thinking about all these other things, you know, and I'm trying to save the babies, right? So yes, diminishing message, I do think about that quite often. Um, you know, how much of a distraction am I going to be? And so, you know, it, it just depends on the situation. But all the same, I mean, I literally um, started wearing, I always wore sequins when I went out, but then I started wearing on a daily basis. Um, so like if it were colder today, I would be wearing this all day. And, uh, but the reason I started wearing it is because my father passed away. And the grief was immense, as you can imagine. And so because I was so depleted, um, I really wanted to receive some good positive energy. And so I started wearing sequins. I didn't have hard glasses at the time. And so even the person who looks at you and does not want to smile, you've seen them, they smile. You <laughs> can't help it. It's freaking sequins in the middle of the day, right? And so now I'm receiving positive energy, and now I can give it back, because now I'm smiling, because you're smiling, right? And that's how that works. I think all of these things are really important, especially when we're talking about design and urban planning and all these things. You Humans, we're humans, and we're going to be interacting with each other, and we pass each other on the street, and we're in, you know, in the line together at the grocery store. I love our Whole Foods in Detroit. We play soul music. People are dancing and singing together in the aisles. Those are the kinds of experiences that I would love to just be continuous, quite honestly. And I know a lot of us think, oh, you gotta be serious, you're you know, an adult, whatever. Um, but that's BS, that's a construct, right? And we all know that. And we're, we're choosing to behave in any way that we want to. But, um, but play, 
laughter, pleasure, opens portals in people's minds, even when they didn't expect it or want it. And, you know, if we're trying to liberate people here, we got to keep opening these portals. I'm actually going to continue on the same topic because I was very struck by your statement that you do by the pleasure principle. Mm -hmm. And you know, when you said that, you reminded me of people I worked with in Rio, in Brazil, uh, NGOs, bottom up social uh, organizations made up of young black favela dwellers who very deliberately opt for a politics of joy and celebration and using all the you know wonderful music and the beat of the drums of uh, Africa of the Brazilian uh, of the African matrix actually or Brazilian culture to uh, to tackle very very difficult stories mm -hmm. and to tackle very very tough realities of human suffering and pain mm -hmm. and I you know in your presentation I was moved by the way in which you described all that pain that goes with the lack of water and the way that Sishi treats black bodies in your statement of living by the pleasure principle I thought that was extraordinary and I wanted to hear a bit more about that perhaps goes with uh, humor and where it's sequins and the Right. Yeah. Good. Well, I think that, and then on top of it, the black body was never meant to experience pleasure, joy, laughter, love. We we're objects. Shit, we, we weren't yes. even seen as human. <laughs> we, we weren't even counted as human for centuries, right? So this is a rebellion for sure. It's a rebellion. And most of my friends who engage in this kind of pleasure activism are very clear on that. Um, we will not be denied these pleasures anymore. Uh, so, you know, black joy, hashtag black joy, uh, is real and circulates uh, because, you know, you weren't supposed to be joyful. Uh, it is the pleasure principle, I think, though, kind of transcends black bodies. I think that everybody should feel pleasure. And we're so bogged down in the work and our families and stress, um, which is killing us slowly, um, but probably advancing <laughs> our aging process or when we die. <laughs> and you laugh, but I don't want any more activists to die early. Um, they're doing great work, and I'm so thankful for them. And I literally am inspired by them. Um, on a daily basis. I, I support activists, um, I'm seen as an activist, but not like, like my, my friends and my social justice community. They're amazing. They put it all on the line. And uh, so inserting some joy into that is really important. Um, because when you're so close to the issues and you know the nitty gritty and how nasty it is, like running for mayor, I know politics now. I, I've heard all the gossip. I know probably more than I want to know. So we already theorize it's kind of gross, but it's really gross, it's really dark, it's really sad, and it can be very dystopian feeling. Um, and I'm a person who's all about utopia. So, uh, so yeah, you know, the pleasure principle is what keeps me safe, it keeps me waking up every day, it keeps me going. Um, otherwise, I think I would be in a corner somewhere crying every day. Like, and I'm sure a lot of you agree. Um, it can get really difficult because you're overwhelmed. There's just so much to do. Um, and so we're only hitting on a little bit of it right now, right? Um, but we all know that there, it's just enormous. And how, how will we ever, ever, you know, tackle it all? And that's why we take a breather and we say we'll take this one piece. But at the same time, I'm going to have a really good dinner and a good glass of wine. I'm going to watch my favorite show, you know? And I'm going to laugh, make love, I don't know, play with my dog. It's, it's all extremely important and it's all part of the work. And we have to remember that pleasure is part of the work. So I think uh, 
on that note, um, <laughs> it's time for dinner. <laughs> yeah, no, thank but, uh, you guys. Thank you, Ingrid. I just want to say, um, so as you kind of decenter, you know, the, the elite white male body in the center of the U.S., we start to have very productive conversations about both problems that are shared in the North and South, but also how imaginations also move between North and South. So that's what we're Thank you, Ingrid, and let's go eat. Thank you.